What is Jesus talking about? Here are these words from Luke 17, verse 1 to 17. Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to sin are bound to come. But woe to that person through whom they come. It would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around his neck than for some or for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. So watch yourselves. Be careful. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times come back to you and says, I repent, forgive me. The apostle said to the Lord, he says, increase our faith. We need more. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea. And it will obey. Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit next to me and have something to eat? Would he not rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? And after that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did not, or he did what he was told to do. So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. This is the word of God, the people of God. <laughs> you know, I love this part of scripture. Because it reminds me of how, how Christians are, are funny people, aren't they? In fact, in one of his books, Chuck Swindoll, a noted Christian author, tells about a lady who wanted desperately to go on a tour of Israel. But she wanted a sign to confirm that it was God's will that she go. So the morning after she began planning the trip, she woke up at 7.47 a.m. That's an odd time for her. The tour group to Israel was planning to fly over on 7.47 yet. That was her sign that confirmed God was going to bless this trip. So she made her plans. Another young man needed to buy a car. But he wanted to know that whatever car he bought was in God's will for him. One night he, he had a dream in which everything he saw was yellow, color of a mustard seed. You know, the next day he went out to the car manager and he bought the yellowest car that he could find. And true to the form, the car was a real lemon. <laughs> And then there was this deacon who wanted to be a pastor. But he didn't want to spend a few years in seminary. He didn't want to put the time into the studies. Would God approve of him buying a fake seminary degree from an online degree? No. The deacon concluded that this was certainly God's will. After he read 1 Timothy 3.13 from the King James Version, it says this, it says, For they that have used the office of a deacon will purchase to themselves a good degree. I kind of think he took that out of, out of context, don't you? You see, these well-meaning people looking for a sign, looking for a sign to remind them of Jesus. Jesus' disciples asking him for more faith. Our lesson today. Already in Luke 9, the Master had given them the power and the authority to heal and cast out demons. What else could they want? You would think that this would be enough. 
They were with Jesus every day. What more could Jesus possibly give them? The answer is, he doesn't give them anything more. Nothing. Notice how Jesus answers their request. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree over here, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you.
Then after dinner, would you, would you thank the servant? Because he did what he was told to do. Then Jesus adds these interesting words. He says, so you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Here is a teaching that is so out of step with our times that it will take some interpretation. You see, Jesus lived in a, in a world in which slavery was a fact of life. In such a world, if a master of the house saw a servant in the field, he would not say to him, come on in and get cleaned up while I fix you some dinner. No. He would say, when you finish your work, come in and prepare my meal. I'm getting hungry. Then after he had eaten the meal, he would not have gone out of his way to say thank you to the servant. Nor would the servant expect to be thanked. He had simply done his duty. You and I would not fare well in this culture, would we? You see, we like to be appreciated for our work. We like to be patted on the back and rewarded. We would not like being a faithless servant. Reminds me of the story of Anthony Hopkins, who was an actor once spent some time with a professional butler and preparing, preparing for his role. This butler measured his success by how well he could be of service while not drawing attention to himself. The real test of a butler's excellence, he says, is that the room seems emptier when he's in it. That is a concept that is alien to us. We don't want to disappear into the woodwork. We like people to recognize us when we've done a good job and to say, well done, or even on occasion to give an extravagant praise. In fact, there was an article in a leading magazine a few months back about the challenge many companies have today giving their younger workers constant positive reinforcement. You see, because of the high self-esteem self -esteem movement, that is what many of today's young adults have gotten at home and in school from the day they were born. You're the greatest. There's never been anyone like you before. You know, it's getting hard for people in our society to imagine doing anything simply and solely because it's a duty. To set Jesus' words in a more contemporary setting, we might imagine paying our light bill when you send that small fortune off to, uh, to pay your utilities. You don't expect a letter back from the president of the power company saying, well done, you paid out of time, super, good job. Keep up the good work. We're proud of you. No, we pay our bill because it's our responsibility. Particularly if we don't want our lights turned off. Or what about when we pay our taxes? We don't expect a letter from the commissioner of the IRS saying, you're a super citizen. I wish we had 10 million more like you. So also, says Jesus, when we serve God, we are only doing our duty. We don't deserve any special reward. Neither do we need any special gifts to carry out our work. We don't need any special spiritual insights. We don't even need an abundance of faith. What we need is to show up and be willing do our part. Reminds me of another story by Pastor Douglas Meyer who tells about a phone telephone call he received recently from a teenager. She called to let him know she wanted to do something to help people. But, she says, 
She could only help on Saturday after 2 and before 5 because she had sports and studies and a, and a busy social schedule. And she really didn't want to do anything outside with bugs. <laughs> but her mother said to be here it was with people because that looks best on your college resume. She liked the idea of working with the hungry, but she didn't, she didn't want to cook anything, and she definitely did not want to do dishes, but helping people was something she really wanted to do, and on and on and on. <laughs> the truth of the matter is that that's how too many people want to serve today, when it's convenient for them, when it is within their area of expertise when they can receive some recognition and appreciation. Servanthood is really an alien concept for many of us. If I were to ask you what it would really mean for you to take up a cross and carry it, many of you would look at me as if I was from Mars. The disciples thought that their problem was that they lacked faith. Jesus told them that was not the problem at all. The problem was a lack of commitment. The problem is ours too today, isn't it? Lack of commitment. Dr. Isaac Watts put our situation in the hymn a couple of centuries ago. Listen to the words of this song. Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of set of ease, while others fought to win the prize and sail through the bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend to grace to help me on to God? Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by the Word. Are those sentiments lost on us? Are we too affluent? Too pampered? Too comfortable? To hear and appreciate the words of the Gospel? Father John Deere tells about a friend of his who died several years ago from cancer. She was a very lively, outgoing person, says Father Deere, who worked in, in two big parishes in Long Island, New York, and was very involved in many good causes, including the struggle to abolish the death penalty of nuclear weapons. Just before she died, she said to him, John, I figured out the meaning of life. He said, really? Tell me. She said, when you're a child and a teenager, you serve. When you're in your 20s, beginning life and starting a family, you serve. When you're in your 30s and 40s, you serve. When you're in the Middle Ages, you serve. When you're in your 60s and 70s and starting to retire, you serve. When you move into your 80s and start to slow down, you serve. When you get sick, you serve. When you're dying, you serve. And on your last day, as you die, you serve. That's true, isn't it? You serve. Without fuss. Sometimes with little recognition and not a lot of glory. It's only when you pass over to the other side to be received into the arms of Jesus that you hear these ultimate words of commendation. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Come and share my joy. You see, folks, that's who we are. We are servants. We serve because there was one who served us. We are not seeking to 
work our way to heaven. That's already taken care of because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. But our salvation came about because once long ago, the Lord of all the universe was willing to take upon himself the role of a servant. What did he do the night before he passed away? He put a towel around his waist. And he went around and washed the feet of the disciples. As a reminder, go and do as I have done for you. Now God calls us to service. Not because it will look good on our resume. Not because we will be praised for it. But because that is who we are. We are followers of the man who became a servant to all. That we might be sons and daughters of the Most High. Does this make any sense? Can you sense that we have a crisis of commitment? A crisis of servanthood in our society? Can you sense that the lookout for number one attitude has taken something very important out of our character. Sometimes that crisis makes itself felt even in the church. And there's jobs that need to be done. A job for which there is little opportunity for recognition and praise. Only hard work. Toiling in relative obscurity. Sometimes without even the sweet sound of success. You know, there's things like teaching a Bible study class. Or our youth. Singing in the choir. Serving on the finance committee. And yet, you hear it often. Oh, Pastor, I can't do that. <laughs> the disciples asked Jesus, for more faith. There's no record that Jesus granted to the course. You see, they didn't need more faith. What they needed was simply to show up for duty. He would give them what they needed. At first, they needed to show up. They needed to say with Isaiah and the prophets, Here I am. Send me. Is that what we're saying today? May God add his blessing to this world.